Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Professor Dr. Luis Maria Palma, President of the International Association for Court Administration. Today, we are developing the fifth session of the online conference program jointly organized by IACA with the State Judicial Administration of Ukraine, the EU Project Private Justice, and USAID Justice for All Activity. This conference is dedicated to gender approach into the justice system. The topics to be covered by the outstanding speakers of this session are implementation of a gender approach into the justice system of Ukraine, those practices in organizing court proceedings in a gender sensitive manner, gender issues in court proceedings and court crimes adjudication. Ms. Yevgenia Bondarenko, national expert of the EU project Private Justice and I, will serve as the moderators. Now I'll summarize again the rules for the session. The online conference will be recorded. We'll introduce each speaker before the presentation. After all the presentations, there will be approximately 10 minutes for questions and answers. We'd appreciate if you could send us your questions using the chat box and identify the speaker to which they are addressed. We kindly request you to mute your microphones. Please, Ms. Yevhenia Vondarenko. Thank you. Дякую, доктор Пальму. Щиро вітаю всіх учасників цієї конференції. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Palma. I'm very happy to welcome uh, all the participants uh, to this conference. Uh, today we are going to uh, discuss uh, a very sensitive issue, which is a gender approach uh, in the justice system. It will not take uh, more uh, of your time uh, and uh, uh, we'll give uh, floor to uh, honor the lawyer of Ukraine, deputy head of the State Judicial Administration uh, of Ukraine, uh, Olha Bulka, uh, who will intervene and tell about uh, uh, implementation of a gender approach uh, to the justice system in Ukraine. Olga, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dear participants, thank you for having me here. I will try to uh, speak uh, very uh, shortly and but comprehensively about some practical experience uh, of uh, the implementation of uh, gender aspects in the activities of, of the State Judicial Administration of Ukraine. In the first place, I need to mention that in Ukraine there is a series of uh, 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 of the list of pieces of legislation and uh, uh, regulations uh, which are aimed at uh, uh, equalizing uh, the um, approach and treating uh, of uh, uh, both uh, men and uh, uh, women uh, who are uh, users uh, of the uh, judicial system. These documents are in place uh, for a while uh, and, and now uh, the uh, development. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, at this uh, time, uh, the development uh, of um, the above-mentioned issues uh, uh, has gained uh, uh, new uh, momentum uh, with the support uh, of international donors such as USAID, Bravo Justice, uh, and uh, other uh, partners. Uh, during uh, yes, 2018-2023, uh, a list uh, of uh, regulations uh, was uh, uh, developed. Uh, these uh, regulations are aimed uh, at uh, the uh, introduction of uh, uh, gender uh, approaches uh, in the activities uh, of the state judicial administration. Uh, Besides, uh, a specialized uh, unit uh, was designated uh, to um, oversee the implementation of the above-mentioned uh, uh, regulations uh, and uh, to uh, counteract uh, uh, to violations uh, uh, of the above-mentioned uh, pieces of uh, regulation. Uh, besides, uh, uh, the uh, head of the State Judicial Administration uh, was uh, empowered uh, to oversee uh, the implementation uh, of uh, uh, such uh, 
uh, regulations. In addition, uh, a specialized uh, uh, position of, of the AJ head counselor uh, was uh, introduced uh, to uh, be uh, responsible to bear responsibility uh, for the implementation uh, of uh, um, the newly adopted uh, provisions. Besides, in the state judicial administration, uh, we uh, hold uh, um, uh, analysis uh, uh, and uh, uh, hold uh, uh, oversight uh, of uh, local uh, uh, regulations uh, in order to check uh, their compliance uh, with the uh, general uh, policy of uh, counteraction to uh, gender-based violations. The state judicial administration uh, constantly uh, oversees uh, the above mentioned uh, issue, issues. Besides, uh, the uh, state judicial administration of Ukraine has become uh, the uh, very first uh, institution within the judiciary, which uh, held uh, a so-called uh, gender audit. Uh, back in 2017, with the support of a Canadian uh, project, uh, uh, the gender audit was uh, held. Uh, the audit covered the state judicial administration of Ukraine uh, only. Uh, as a result of such uh, uh, gender uh, audit, uh, uh, some strengths and weaknesses uh, have been uh, identified, uh, which uh, led to the development uh, of uh, uh, respective uh, recommendations and uh, guidelines. Uh, respective needs uh, have been uh, identified uh, and uh, uh, the most uh, important uh, uh, deliverable of that uh, audit uh, was uh, the uh, gender strategy uh, developed uh, in uh, the stage at the state judicial administration. Uh, the strategy uh, was uh, developed for the years 2021-2025. Uh, uh, the uh, strategy set up uh, five key goals. The implementation uh, of the strategy uh, will uh, allow a comprehensive uh, gender uh, approach uh, to be uh, implemented. Uh, It will contribute to uh, strengthening uh, of institutional uh, capacity, uh, performance. Uh, uh, it will it will uh, facilitate a greater uh, accountability in the uh, state judicial administration, and uh, finally, it is uh, aimed uh, uh, to facilitate uh, better communication and uh, uh, greater. Um, establishment of uh, partnership of relations of uh, uh, partnership between uh, the state judicial administration of uh, Ukraine and uh, other uh, stakeholders. Uh, this year, uh, the uh, intermediary uh, analysis uh, of the strategy implementation uh, was uh, held, which covered the two year period of the strategy implementation. The respective uh, uh, results uh, uh, have been properly uh, recorded, and uh, we hope uh, that the strategy uh, will uh, has become uh, the first step toward the development of the overall gender strategy for the whole Ukrainian judiciary. Unfortunately, there is uh, uh, no such uh, strategy in place uh, as of today. Now let me speak uh, about some practical steps uh, and uh, uh, results uh, achieved uh, via the uh, strategy uh, implementation. Um, thus, in the framework uh, of uh, uh, the uh, audit, uh, uh, the state judicial uh, administration uh, holds the uh, uh, gender uh, analysis uh, of the composition of uh, 
local and uh, uh, regional courts, uh, as well as the SGA territorial units, uh, the respective results are available on our uh, official website. Uh, what we also do is uh, uh, hold an analysis uh, of internal uh, documents uh, to check uh, them for compliance uh, with uh, overall uh, gender policy, uh, the principles of uh, non-discrimination, and so on. Uh, it so happened uh, that uh, the courts uh, uh, have to deal uh, with uh, some uh, gender uh, sensitive uh, uh, issues uh, when uh, actually um, performing its uh, functions. Uh, thus, in 2021 and 2022, uh, the um, uh, State Judicial Administration uh, has uh, held a uh, uh, gender analysis of uh, some 50 uh, uh, regulations uh, and uh, uh, of, of the uh, headquarters uh, of the SGA headquarters and uh, some 1,000 uh, documents uh, issued uh, by the territorial units uh, of the State Judicial Administration of Ukraine. Besides, uh, we have uh, uh, organized uh, events uh, aimed at prevention uh, of uh, 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 sexual harassment uh, uh, at uh, workplace and uh, other types uh, of gender-based uh, violence. As I have already mentioned, uh, one of our uh, key goals uh, was uh, consisted in the improvement uh, of judicial statistics. Uh, in particular, via the improvement uh, of uh, documents uh, for uh, respective forms uh, for collection of uh, uh, court uh, statistics. So for instance, uh, in now we have uh, specialized uh, uh, blank forms uh, which uh, allow uh, recording uh, the gender of uh, uh, victims, uh, uh, whether they are men, uh, women, children, um, these statistics uh, is uh, properly uh, recorded, uh, uh, generalized, uh, and uh, uh, placed uh, in an uh, anonymized uh, uh, form uh, on the official website uh, of the State Judicial Administration. Uh, so these uh, activities uh, are held uh, in, in particular as a part uh, of the uh, nationwide uh, effort uh, to improve uh, the state of play uh, in the gender-related uh, issues. So our, our uh, statistics uh, becomes a part of uh, statistical data collected uh, by uh, Ukrainian government. Uh, besides, uh, the State Judicial Administration uh, holds cooperation with various uh, uh, international uh, programs uh, uh, for addressing gender-related uh, issues, uh, in particular with the uh, USAID uh, project. Uh, our another uh, goal is uh, to um, create uh, safe spaces uh, uh, for uh, uh, court uh, uh, users uh, in uh, court uh, premises, uh, in particular when it comes uh, to uh, gender sensitive uh, cases. Uh, to this end, uh, we hold cooperation with uh, uh, international donors, uh, for instance, uh, with the EU project uh, Bravo Justice, uh, who provided uh, us uh, with a manual or a brand book, a model court, uh, a brand book which contains uh, information about uh, the equipment uh, of uh, uh, special uh, safe uh, zones uh, for vulnerable witnesses, vulnerable uh, victims uh, for uh, participants to court proceedings uh, uh, with uh, children, uh, and as a result of such cooperation, uh, 143 uh, trainers uh, uh, were uh, trained uh, to um, deliver uh, trainings uh, on uh, vulnerable 
on, on uh, delivery of services for vulnerable witnesses uh, uh, beside uh, besides the uh, 17 uh, courts across uh, the country uh, have uh, volunteer services uh, uh, with the overall uh, number of volunteers uh, going up to 300. On the website of the State Judicial Administration uh, of Ukraine, uh, there is uh, a special uh, tab on gender equality issues. Uh, uh, this uh, page uh, contains uh, uh, various information and statistics uh, on uh, gender uh, equality. Uh, it contains information about uh, uh, implementation of a uh, gender approach uh, in the state judicial administration and uh, success stories of women in the judicial system. In January 2023, uh, we held uh, an anonymized uh, survey among uh, the SJA employees in the headquarters and uh, in the territorial units. You can see the results uh, in the screen. Uh, some 70% uh, of respondents uh, believe that the gender policy is uh, uh, properly taken into account uh, uh, by uh, in the in the policy and programs of the SGA of Ukraine. Besides, uh, some 90% of respondents uh, believe that the state judicial administration of Ukraine uh, does uh, enough uh, or more than enough uh, to uh, counteract uh, uh, or prevent uh, uh, gender-based uh, 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 violations uh, in the judicial system. In the meantime, there are, uh, of course, uh, some, um, uh, some, some, some drawbacks. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, the lack uh, of uh, uh, proper uh, taking into account of uh, uh, needs uh, uh, of uh, men and uh, uh, women uh, when uh, developing um, a corporative uh, policies and uh, requesting for respective uh, funding. Uh, however, here I need uh, to say that when making the budget request to the Ministry of uh, Economy of Ukraine, uh, all the uh, relate, gender related uh, aspects uh, are taken into account and properly articulated uh, in the documents submitted. However, uh, sometimes uh, this uh, effort is of purely uh, formal nature and does not uh, translate into any um, practical uh, result. The neighbors also between victims and perpetrators and uh, the parties to the court proceedings. Also, there is a need uh, to uh, for systematization and improvement uh, of uh, the overall practice in court operations. I presented information on taking into account this gender as aspects in the territorial units of the state judicial administration. Now let's go to the next slide. Of course, each of us will agree that uh, the full-scale war in Ukraine has shifted temporarily some priorities in the activities of each bodies, including the state judicial administration state judicial administration. However, the gender approaches in uh, the activities of the state judicial administration are not fully on hold. We are interacting with international partners. Uh, we continue our interaction with the USA Justice for All activity when it comes to the gender sensitivity in uh, the judiciary and that its involvement will also go into the gender sensitive uh, cases uh, to further take them into account uh, when uh, uh, analyzing the cases and also some actually now I have uh, 
covered uh, briefly the activities of the state judicial administration and uh, all our contributions are posted on the website of the state judicial administration. You can uh, look it up. First of all, thank you so much uh, every to every state judicial administration staff member, especially Natalia Mokarova, because she is really, really into this topic. Thank you so much for your intervention. Indeed, it's hard to prepare so much information and present it. Uh, and uh, I want to say that each of you will have access to these presentations. Now, not to take up any more of our time, I'll give the floor to Titana Foulet, PhD in law, awarded lawyer, and uh, the head of the Department of Methodological Support of the State National School of Judges of Ukraine will be speaking about gender approach, but also but from the standpoint of education. Our experts uh, are very much requested to deliver their interventions within uh, the timeline, and everyone who wants to uh, ask something please feel free to write them in chat uh, at the end of the event uh, we'll discuss them dear titana the floor is yours thank you Evgenia. dear dr palma dear participants uh, of this online conference thank you for your attention to this topic at such challenging time indeed uh, the opinion from the standpoint of uh, legal education and uh, gender approach i want to clarify here that uh, the national school of judges of ukraine provides training for judges for uh, judicial staff uh, and for candidate judges that's why we have some specific features in training of each specific uh, group so i'll be speaking of judges mostly today and uh, just as a brief reminder, I'm sure you've heard that this National School of Judges of Ukraine is guided by the national standards of uh, judicial education developed uh, almost 10 years uh, ago. In 2014, we first uh, set this bar for ourselves. We drafted standards. And uh, each training course and each curriculum are aimed at not only developing knowledge they have the knowledge component but it's they not the only one it also is aimed at uh, getting or improving skills and what we call the values in uh, judges therefore these three dimensions to put it uh, this way, knowledge, skills, uh, and uh, values, they are the one, the most important ones when it comes to the development of each course. I'll be speaking of three questions today. First question starts uh, with uh, the following slide. Shows why it's important. Then what the school did in the, over the last couple of years and. So uh, then um, our further improvements. As far as gender sensitivity is concerned and where this term comes from, it goes without saying that uh, there is 33rd uh, recommendation of uh, CIDOL when uh, this term has to do with uh, the whole judiciary. As we see it, only one paragraph, but only one uh, that has to do with both the judicial system and a number of other notions and therefore what we are used to to consider as international standards and traditionally we see here as independence of partiality efficiency etc but it's not only it also, current uh, international standards demand that the justice system be gender sensitive. The next slide shows only a couple of uh, terms where 
there is uh, some feature of gender sensitivity, not only just the system and components, but also a procedure. Mechanisms to deal with issues such as property settlement, land rights, inheritance, manner, manner to handle cases, approach, dispute resolutions, judgments or decisions, etc. So we speak here not only of decisions, but also of other components. How did the school uh, react here? Here you see the cover. The cover page of uh, the publication uh, in Ukrainian. This publication is available of, at the website of the National School of Judges of Ukraine. It's the first uh, survey we carried out uh, with uh, the involvement of OEC project. It's exploration of gender equality and discrimination among judges uh, and uh, advocates. This presents not only the findings of the survey, but also contains uh, an overview of uh, the then CTHR jurisprudence in cases related to uh, gender discrimination and other cases that can be considered to be uh, gender sensitive and specific recommendations for judges, for lawyers. 2015-2016, uh, when this was presented, I can tell you here straight away that in 2016, in June, this uh, was presented at the first uh, uh, all-Ukrainian forum dedicated to gender aspects in the operations of judiciary. Then judges... Um, could staff members, um, court administrators could ask this question and could voice out uh, the challenges faced. And I sincerely hope that international technical assistance projects will continue this uh, and continue supporting this initiative because time flies by. Uh, this initiative was started in 2016, but it wasn't uh, settled as annual or biennial initiative and uh, from that point when uh, there were some specialized courses both the general topics and specific topics next slide shows one of our courses developed for judges trainers of the school it's gender equality through the light of prohibition of uh, discrimination and the light of it is if the thr jurisprudence and it had to do with gender equality when dealing with labor cases. We chose the labor cases uh, on purpose because it was uh, the only field where there were officially recognized problems of uh, gender equality and facts of discrimination and that the, there were some decisions by Ukrainian courts we try to make uh, this course uh, practically oriented and after that we worked on a number of activities what you can see right now the cover page had to do with the target audience uh, being uh, the ju trainer judges it takes into account administration aspects communication and the roles of the president of courts or deputy Presidents of courts, that is, administrative positions they hold outside the administration of justice, it shows so the course that we developed, uh, uh, that uh, what we developed for uh, can for judicial candidates, uh, and uh, it uh, actually had to do now uh, with. Uh, the time of pandemic and it was presented during pandemic uh, on uh, dealing with gender stereotypes uh, the development uh, also had uh, to do uh, with uh, the fact that uh, a complex government uh, program was developed and that there was request as uh, the educational establishment uh, to overcome these gender stereotypes. It goes without saying that challenges had an impact. 
both at this event. It's a pleasure to, to see here Christina Kitt. Uh, greetings to you personally and your fam. Uh, we had a number of uh, events and one of them was in cooperation with the your fam on applying the principle of gender equality and the prohibition of uh, discrimination in light of the challenges related to armed conflict uh, in this june uh, we that was this june and it goes without saying that war had an impact on uh, some topics and on what we are delivering during trainings apart from the courses uh, that have to do with uh, general aspects we also have specialized uh, cases devoted to domestic violence cases uh, to the sexual violence uh, that was committed during conflict that is serious we and we also see some topics that are included in um, periodic training for general uh, courts uh, judges. It's to, be, to put it very briefly, given the fact that we are really low on time, we see that the National School of Judges of Ukraine presents both some uh, separate projects. Dear Tatiana, you have just a minute because we have some speakers who really need to deliver their interventions as per timing so it's i just want to say that it's important to ensure that uh, uh, gender equality is introduced uh, horizontally apart from uh, some courses devoted to gender pr pr issues it's very important that judges uh, recognize uh, uh, the gender aspects in the management of the courtroom and considering cases that were committed against life or some other violent crimes when considering war crimes uh, that is uh, irrespective of the topics or the challenges of some specific categories of cases uh, that uh, they were considering and to finalize uh, just a couple of sentences what can be done it was a pleasure to hear from uh, Uliana that uh, we see some statistics however uh, really, we do lack such statistics. There isn't enough of that, and that's an aspect that can be the fundamental background or the foundation for further surveys. So we have annual reports um, as per jurisdiction, and of course, in criminal justice, uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, gender disaggregated the statistical data items by the administrative justice uh, or commercial jurisdiction it's only about cases and case files we don't see people as such neither men nor women and in civil cases it's a little bit better and i presented a screenshot of uh, the several uh, jurisdiction proceedings we can see that uh, there is one general number that shows that the number of applications to courts by individuals out of the men and women however this data poses some questions uh, they are not um, in line because men and if we look at men and women and if we can compare it to the number of um, applications by individuals we see uh, about 176,000 people. It's not clear who those people are and uh, what, where is the rest. And uh, answering the question by Olga, the criteria for determining uh, gender sensitive cases here, we need to look uh, at uh, the example of other countries that started such statistics. Uh, how many people? go to court who of them are men who of them are women what is uh, their background and then we can see what aspect of uh, social roles and what aspect of uh, gender component uh, can be present thank you so much dear tatiana ready to answer your questions so we will surely come back to this discussion uh, while um, Q&A session now, I'd like to give the floor to Kristina Kitt, uh, 
who is a very well-known person in this area in defending the gender and uh, even introducing terminology to be used actively, feminine forms for lawyers and uh, uh, the other legal professionals, so Christina Kitt, uh, the advocate and the president of uh, the URFEM, uh, the NGO devoted to gender issues. Uh, hello, dear colleagues, uh, here in my uh, short uh, presentation, I'll cover what was already mentioned by my colleagues. So I'd like to mention uh, the gender sensitivity index in terms of the judiciary and uh, this uh, gender sensitivity issue that's where we worked on before the full-scale invasion. And uh, if uh, we had to update it today, I guess uh, we would uh, have a different look at it uh, as to what might, must be reflected in this gender sensitivity issue. And in terms of uh, the gender sensitivity and the judiciary that was uh, prepared by you said project, I guess it was 2021 when we reviewed this uh, index and this index has uh, is made up of four blocks. First block is about leadership uh, and uh, uh, the gender balanced approach. The second one about training programs. So uh, the things that was that were mentioned by the in detail. Third block, uh, it's about uh, using gender sensitive approach uh, in uh, gender sensitive cases. Uh, and in this index, we tried. Uh, to, in this indicator, we try to see what can be taken into account as gender sensitive and then monitoring data that as to gender discrimination in gender sensitive cases. The only thing that was already mentioned by Olga and Tatiana, I'd like to mention that it's very important to focus uh, our attention on monitoring and analysis uh, of uh, gender analysis and approaches uh, uh, when we speak of uh, considering. Christina, uh, sorry, they can see the presentation. Please um, uh, have it full scale. I guess I did it. Just uh, let me try again. Oh, we can share. Oh, that, that. Uh, yes, uh, where I was, so speaking of the statistics, uh, uh, when we touch upon the first block leadership uh, in the uh, judiciary, uh, we can see the following. Uh, the um, uh, number of uh, uh, female uh, judges uh, is uh, equal to uh, male uh, judges, uh, so 50-50, but uh, when we go, so everything is uh, uh, good. Uh, uh, in, in in terms uh, of the uh, judiciary core, but if uh, we uh, look at the hot stuff, uh, we can see more women there. I think it is related to uh, the um, scope of remuneration and uh, uh, workload uh, in the uh, uh, court uh, uh, apparatuses. Uh, so some uh, efforts they need to be made in order to uh, attract uh, more uh, male employees. Uh, if we look at uh, block uh, uh, two, uh, which is uh, about uh, uh, training uh, uh, programs uh, and uh, gender aspects uh, when uh, developing uh, training programs uh, for uh, judges. Uh, so we have new uh, challenges and new needs here, uh, in particular those related to the war. Uh, so uh, some uh, gender uh, sensitive uh, the, the number of gender sensitive uh, cases uh, uh, has uh, increased. Uh, uh, 
there are more vulnerable uh, victims uh, and uh, witnesses, and this uh, need to be uh, taken into account uh, when uh, training uh, judges, in particular on adjudication in uh, various uh, uh, cases uh, related to the conflict. Uh, another uh, important uh, uh, block uh, is uh, uh, about uh, communication and uh, gender sensitive approaches uh, in communications. In communication, it is something uh, which uh, we are trying uh, to uh, address uh, together with uh, international uh, partners uh, and uh, international donors. Uh, last year, many of us, uh, uh, well, actually all of us uh, witnessed, uh, uh, witnessed and uh, many of us can uh, remember uh, scandals uh, uh, related to, to uh, coverage uh, of uh, CRSV cases. Uh, uh, and uh, this uh, block is important uh, from the standpoint uh, of uh, uh, training and uh, shaping uh, the necessary uh, skills and uh, uh, knowledge about uh, how uh, gender uh, sensitive uh, cases uh, should be uh, covered in, in the uh, public in the white public for the white public uh, and uh, finally block number four uh, which is uh, monitoring of uh, data related uh, to uh, administration of uh, uh, justice uh, in gender discrimination related uh, cases uh, so this uh, um, has been partly uh, covered uh, by the previous uh, speaker uh, olga uh, bulka uh, so proper monitoring uh, is uh, needed, uh, especially in the light uh, of, uh, uh, of of the current uh, uh, realities, uh, which are full scale in invasion, uh, uh, wartime, uh, and uh, uh, the regime of martial law. Uh, Olha mentioned today the gender strategy of the judiciary. I will also only add that the SJA uh, gender strategy uh, may become a basis for the development of a wider and more comprehensive gender strategy of the whole uh, judicial uh, system. Uh, we uh, have uh, tried uh, to uh, negotiate uh, and include uh, the uh, gender equality uh, unit to uh, the um, nationwide uh, restitution plan. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, the effort in this uh, uh, direction uh, need to be uh, multiplied. Uh, now, uh, going uh, further towards uh, the recommenda recommendations. We have uh, uh, already uh, come up uh, with the idea of uh, setting up uh, a, a special uh, working group on uh, gender issues uh, to promote uh, um, gender related uh, agenda at the governmental level. Besides, uh, uh, we articulated uh, the need to update uh, the um, uh, gender sensitivity uh, index in the activities uh, of uh, judicial institutions. Besides, uh, we have suggested to hold uh, uh, the um, additional um, survey uh, aimed at uh, uh, update uh, of uh, um, information and uh, on, on the state of play uh, in the uh, judiciary in terms uh, of uh, gender equality. It is uh, also important uh, to continue working on uh, gender sensitive issues. 
Uh, Christina, my apologies. Uh, uh, we have some time limitations, so please mind your uh, timeline. So, uh, okay, uh, I will uh, try to uh, wrap up sh shortly. Uh, so, um, I was my point was uh, that there is a need uh, to continue working on uh, gender sensitive uh, issues, uh, which are. Uh, common uh, and uh, overlapping uh, for the judiciary as well as uh, for law, en law enforcement bodies. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention and I remain in your disposal. Thank you very much, Christina, and uh, I turn it uh, over to Dr. Palma. Thank you so much, Ms. Kitt, for providing this enlightening presentation on the importance of information processing and specific training to properly monitor how the management of such a sensitive issue evolves. Now we'll continue with the presentation of the following theme, best practices in organizing court proceedings in a gender-sensitive manner. Please, Mr. Mackin Hatkit, international expert of the EU project Prabo Justice, international prosecutor and barrister. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, and and thank you for having me. Uh, speaking at the at the conference, um, I just want to approach this from the perspective of best practices in organising proceedings in a gender sensitive manner, and what I mean by that is the moment that a victim comes through the door right the way through to the moment that the judge delivers the verdict in a case and in many ways beyond that too. So in the short time that I have with you today, I just want to try and emphasize, I think I've, I've done this a lot in a number of talks that I've made within Ukraine, is to try and emphasize the joined up approach that has to be taken in cases of uh, gender sensitive matters. And when I say that from my perspective, I mean cases that involve conflict related sexual violence uh, and sexual gender based violence. Um, and also violence and sexual offences against children. So first of all, from an investigatory perspective, it, it is important in my um, submission that from the very start, the investigator in the case who is the first responder and the first person who the victim will come into contact with is first of all trained, but then acts in a way which is sensitive to that victim's gender and the specific needs. And this can often be seen in cases where there are historic complaints of a sexual nature. Because what investigators and prosecutors, and, and I think also judges need to do, is to try and put to one side any preconceived attitudes that they have as regards what they think a victim should act uh, in a way in any particular circumstances. For example, in many sexual gender-based violence cases, there is a delay between the actual offence and the victim being um, attacked or assaulted or raped, there is often a delay between that uh, and the actual complaint to any investigative authorities. Now that delay can, can be weeks, it, it can be months, and in some cases that I deal with, certainly in the United Kingdom, it can be years. Now, those sort of cases, in my view, uh, need a, a very specific approach to try and understand that in that for victims of sexual violence, there is no one set victim as regards how that person will act. Some victims will act uh, and make a complaint almost immediately. Other victims will internalize, understandably, the traumatic events that they have uh, been experienced. Um, uh, two, uh, and they will not complain about matters until a number of years later. So for investigators and prosecutors, those being the first responders, taking the first accounts from those victims, it's important that there aren't any preconceived ideas as regards the way 
a victim should act. All victims are different. All victims will make a complaint in a different way. Or all victims will give evidence in a different way. So from that very beginning, there needs to be a gender sensitive approach as regards the obtaining of the statement and the understanding that the investigator and prosecutor gives towards that victim. Uh, and when I say understanding, what I really mean for that individual to listen, to ask simple questions uh, and to act with humanity being aware of the gender sensitive issues. And that ties back in with what I first said about the, the training that's required. Uh, and sometimes uh, I think mentoring for people who will be the first responders to deal with people of gender sensitive violence. So what my views are as regards organizing best practices is that first of all, we need proper training then we need investigators and prosecutors who are sensitive to these issues, not only from a training perspective, because as we all know, some people can go into training, but and, and then not follow that training through into how they practice. What it is so important is that those trainings that investigators and prosecutors are involved in are then followed through into actual practice. Because, and I was making some notes just as, just as I was listening to the other speakers as regards what I was going to say in, in my very brief presentation. And I was thinking in the end, why do we seek to adhere to best practices? There's a number of reasons for that. First of all, we want to try and get the best evidence from the victim. But also what we want to do is to try and treat that victim with humanity, being aware of the gender sensitive issues so that that victim is not re-traumatized or not additionally traumatized um, in having to speak and give their account. So it's so important from many different perspectives that within the criminal justice pathway that Investigators, then prosecutors, deal with victims in a way in which will allow those people to give the best possible account in the best possible circumstances. When I say the best possible account, I'm saying the fullest account possible as regards what they remember of the traumatic effects of the incident uh, that they were subject to. So for example, I prosecuted a case, a war crimes case, when I was in Kosovo, which involved a, a male victim. Uh, and that brought its own issues as regards uh, gender sensitive um, practices, because that male victim had been subject to genital mutilation. Um, and he was tortured, he was beaten, but also his genitals were were mutilated by his attackers. That required me to put in place the best possible services in order to allow him to give his account to me and also to follow through on that account and give his account in court. So it meant the use, and this has already been mentioned, of safe zones for vulnerable victims. It, it meant the use of video recordings of that evidence within that safe zone or, or green room. I think a term has been used, I've heard in a Ukrainian context. Uh, and the playing of that evidence in chief to court. When he was then questioned, he was questioned over a video link. And he was at a remote secure location with a member of court staff, with somebody from the um, psychological services to hand. So it's trying to put these experts in place uh, and various practices in place in order to make sure that that witness in that particular case, because not only was the offence a very gender sensitive one in his particular case, but that person, because of the nature of the defendants, and this is also an aspect in a, a gender sensitive case, he was at physical risk also. 
And I think, again, this is something that we have to bear in mind as regards gender sensitive cases. It, it is often the case that offences of conflict related sexual violence, of sexual gender based violence, of sexual violence against children have been committed within a, a, a power relationship where the perpetrator has held power over the victim and has exercised that power by offending in this particularly awful way. So again, that's another feature that an investigator has to be aware of and a prosecutor when trying to make sure that the proceedings are properly put in place in order to get that witness from investigation through to giving evidence in court. So if I just move on a stage that that, that victim has given an account to a prosecutor and investigator, there has to be explanation, obviously, as regards uh, informed consent. The victim has to be encouraged to ask questions. But what is also important, in my view, is that once that victim is, is interviewed and that interview is recorded, that that victim is simply not sent away uh, without any contact details, without any support, and merely told to come back to court in, in a few weeks or a few months' time. It's important that there are liaison officers in place, that a victim is provided with the, the most simple things, a telephone number, an address, a name, so that victim can be told, look, if there are any issues or any questions that you have, ring this number, visit this drop-in centre, speak to this individual, and we will provide you with support. And again, that links in with making sure that that evidence is preserved, making sure that that victim is looked after and making sure that that victim is in the best possible place, minimising re-traumatisation in order to come to court and give evidence. If we then take it a step further, when it comes to the day of court, it would be my recommendation and practice that prior to the victim having to come to court in evidence and give evidence that that victim is allowed to attend court with an investigator or a, or, or a prosecutor and the basic layout of the court is explained to them. Everything being explained in my experience puts that victim at ease and again maximizes the chances of that victim being able to give the best possible evidence when the court day comes. And again, the visit to the court, that will encourage questions from the victim. That victim can be reassured. And it also depends, in my view, about the prosecutor putting best practices in place so that that victim can give evidence, maybe in the courtroom, but in a separate room from the actual courtroom in order that their evidence can be placed into court via a video link so that the, that victim does not have to physically face the perpetrator within that courtroom and that the court can properly hear that evidence and, and assess its, its probative value without the victim or, or his or her evidence being affected by a possible confrontation uh, between the victim and the perpetrator. What I would also um, suggest, and this has already been touched upon, is judicial training. So we've got investigators, we've got judges, we've got prosecutors, and I will come on to defence lawyers as well. So judicial training, not only to challenge um, any judicial preconceived ideas uh, about how victims may or may not react, but also that, so that that judge can better manage the courtroom and better manage the presentation of the evidence as between the prosecutor and the defence. Because once the victim is given evidence via the prosecutor and the defence are then required or, or allowed to ask questions of the victim, to test that victim's evidence within the process, overall process of a fair trial. It, it is important that the judge 
make sure that the questions from the defense lawyer are properly framed. Uh, and again, those questions should not be aggressive. They should stick to the relevant issues in the case. If there is an issue about consent, then those issues should be uh, dealt with as best and as, as, as carefully as possible by defense lawyers under the supervision of a judge so as not to offend any fair trial principles. But I think it's also necessary that defense lawyers, their role is recognized within the system and that they have proper training as regards how these cases that are gender sensitive will be processed within the court system. And that will allow them to do their job better. And it will allow, if they can do their job better, get to the point and ask relevant questions, it then means that the victim is subject to less traumatization overall. Uh, and it will allow the court to make a, a more objective decision, in my view, as regards the evidence. I think what's also important from an evidence perspective and assessment of that evidence, and I say this as a prosecutor uh, and also as uh, somebody who often works with judges as regards the analysis of this evidence, is that sometimes with victims of sexual violence, certainly if there has been a long period between the offence and the and the complaint to the authorities, there might not be any corroboration. And I think sometimes the temptation is by prosecutors and by judges to, to think less of the case and less of the complainant, first of all, because of the delay and also because that there's not corroboration. Now, in many occasions, because of the nature of these gender offences, these offences have happened behind closed doors. If it's in a domestic violence setting, there aren't any witnesses. Um, if it's a rape that occurred 10 years ago or six months ago, there is no DNA evidence. So it's, it's important that I think prosecutors and judges keep an open mind. Uh, and in the particular case in Kosovo, we didn't have any corroboration, save for some injury marks. And my submission to the judge was, you've heard this witness, that witness has been cross-examined, that witness's evidence has been tested. My submission to the judge was, you can accept that that witness is telling the truth. It's a very simple submission. They've given evidence, they've given detailed evidence. You don't need to look for any more corroboration if you believe what that witness says. And I think that's, I mean, for me, that's an important message to prosecutors and judges when they come to consider these sorts of cases. Um, I've gone through very quickly. I hope I haven't overstepped my, my time on this, uh, but I hope I've covered my views as regards best practices from investigation through to the ultimate delivering of the, the verdict but my final point now would be, is that after the verdict, the victim should not just be put to one side and left to their own devices. One of the most difficult jobs I have as a prosecutor is going to see the victim after the verdict has been delivered in a sexual violence case, if the defendant has been found not guilty. And remember, it's a fair trial process. Um, I've got to go and tell the victim the court has found the defendant not guilty. I've got to then go through the reasons to a, a distraught victim as to why that might have happened. So that's explaining to the victim about the burden and the standard of proof that the court may have been looking for, a, for some additional corroboration and the court might not have been able in the circumstances to feel that they could be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt, that very high burden that the prosecution have in order to prove the case. But what I try and do is, is say to the victim, I am not saying that I have not believed you, but we, were, we are working within a criminal justice system where there is a very high burden to try and prove offences of this nature. There has to be follow-up as well as regards the victim, whatever the result. There has to be made available to the victim 
the relevant psychological services and also any any services as regards the possibility of, of compensation within the Ukrainian system. Uh, but also it, it's often the case that that victims may well have an additional story to tell as well. Uh, and the victim after one case, I was raped on one occasion, uh, the, the trial is over, may then spill everything out and, and give other accounts of what may or may not have happened to them in the past. So at every stage of the process, uh, me as a prosecutor, investigators and judges have to hope within the difficult context of a, a trial and a criminal justice pathway that we, in, we try and be aware of the necessity for a gender sensitive approach. Uh, and my simple principles, and I think I outlined, outlined these to police officers um, two weeks ago in Ukraine, is to listen to the victim, keep questions simple, and always, always act with humanity and respect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hackett, for such a profound presentation on best organizational related practices on the gender sensitive approach regarding victim protection, including war crime cases and the necessary preparation of investigators, prosecutors, and lawyers to fulfill their duties to the best of their ability so justice can be properly served. Please, Ms. Alicia Davis, Principal Court Management Consultant with the National Center for State Courts. Ms. Davis, thank you. Is yours. thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Palma. And thanks to all of you. It's a tremendous honor to join you today. And I will say that I've learned a great deal. Um, I admire your dedication to a gender approach. Um, in my work as a consultant for the National Center for State Courts, I work with courts in the US and elsewhere and um, in, the, in improving the administration of justice. And so I would like to limit my brief remarks today to the organization of court proceedings and a gender sensitive matter. And it was interesting to me to hear from the preceding speakers how aligned we are in approach. Um, so I'll be addressing three issues um, and that would be governance and the establishment of gender and justice commissions. Um, I'll speak to user voice as well as the use of data and statistics. If we could pass to the next slide, please. So first of all, in terms of governance, um, I wanted to address the gender, the establishment of gender and justice commissions. There are a few examples of this in the United States and I'm offering the best example, which exists in the state of Washington. And as you can see here, the chairs are, um, one is a justice of the Supreme Court, so the highest authority in the state, as well as a judge that sits, um, that currently presides over issues of gender violence. And it's in this manner that they are able to receive leadership from above, as well as the everyday experience of <laughs> presiding over gender issues. This is the central gathering place where they put together all studies concerning gender. They present all statistics. They talk about policies and practices to be observed within the courts, um, such as those that Barrister Hackett was addressing. And these are all, these are all examples that you've given today of, of different um, aspects of organizing proceedings in a gender, gender respectful manner. And in all transparency, um, commissions like this in the US are all too rare given the importance of the issues, but it really is an admirable example of the way to ensure that the courts are enhancing equal treatment of all parties and that they serve as a liaison between the courts and other organizations within the community to work towards a community that's free of bias. If we can move to the next slide. The next issue is that of user voice and the importance of in any court procedure that the user voice is central to the experience. So I wanted to present an example that um, our organization presided over in April, 2022 on the heels of the pandemic. 
And in this, we had heard from so many courts about the exciting technologies that they had put in place in order to enhance the user experience in gender violence cases. And we wanted to ensure that during the pandemic and all of the rush to translate in court, court, in court proceedings to the virtual environment, that the user voice was central and that nothing was lost in that experience and perhaps even enhanced. Because as we know, that technology can greatly assist the parties that are affected by violence. It can prevent them from having to leave a home, which can be the most dangerous time for a, part, for a person affected by violence to leave um, a, a violent relationship. And so we brought together courts, we brought together staff, judges, advocates, across the country to listen to what the experience had been. And from this, we learned that parties were experiencing that because of the pandemic, there was much less staff available to support them, that this presented a challenge. Oftentimes the procedures were so complex that people had a hard time navigating, had a hard time knowing from which, from which step to proceed, how to, how to engage in the next step. Um, we learned a great deal about as a result of that confusion about the procedures, how that was impacting the issuance of orders of protection. We learned that community connections had been damaged in the translation to the virtual environment. And by that I refer to access to advocates. In the US system in particular, the figure of the advocate is primordial. It is the person that can sit to the, to the right of the person affected, can speak on their behalf, can ensure that they are able to present their information in a manner that the court can receive and take action. And so if that person in the translation to the virtual environment is not present, a great deal of support is lost. And so through these conversations, we learned how important it would be to reinforce community connections and ensure that that support was available. We learned other things that the poor litigant experience, meaning that oftentimes the parties participating, the audio was insufficient, they weren't able to connect, there wasn't enough bandwidth, um, and that that certainly affected their ability to proceed meaningfully and to seek the support that they needed. Language access is a significant barrier, and I'm happy to report that a number of courts have taken active measures to ensure that access is available in someone's native language. And there are a variety of languages that need to be accommodated in our system. And finally, technology barriers. And so from these conversations, we were able to establish somewhat of a checklist. And it's by far um, not entirely inclusive, but I thought it might be helpful. It was helpful to us to present a rubric to consider these various elements, if we could proceed to the next slide. So from this, in the, in the implementation of any issue of any policy affecting gender, we established this checklist to consider that there are the concrete user-centric issues, such as those barriers that we just, we just looked at, the technology issues, the language barriers, the, um, the difficulties connecting with advocates within the community. But then there are the more abstract user-centric issues that parties coming before the court need to feel that the court is responsive to their culture, to their background. They need to feel a sense of procedural justice, that the forum in which they present themselves is fair. Um, that forum also needs to be trauma-informed and aware of the experiences that bring the party to the court. It also needs to involve non-traditional stakeholders. One of the examples that came to us from the result of holding this forum is that a, a judge in one of our, our Western states had made a particular emphasis to bring in the deaf community. And they were so surprised that anyone would make specific outreach to them. 
And as a result, they were able to have a, a series of conversations to greatly experience, to greatly improve the experience of parties that are traditionally extremely marginalized and removed from the situation. Um, finally, there's court culture and workforce resources, the entire container upon which a, a gender approach can, can work effectively. And you can see these various elements here of ensuring that those that staff, that there are plentiful staff, that they're educated, they know how to perform their, um, their roles in a gender responsive manner and that they have the resources that they need to execute their duties. And then finally, again, ensuring the responsiveness to various marginalized communities, um, especially as I mentioned, because language access tends to be such a significant uh, issue in courts. If we could proceed to the next slide, the area of greatest interest for us now, and I was really interested to hear um, the statistics, the, the data capacity that you have um, for collecting information. This came about because a number of judges across the country reached out to us independently. And when three or four judges from across the country reach out with the same issue, you have to think that it's more than a coincidence. And these judges were reporting that it seems that given the backlog that all courts are experiencing, the requirements that we have to hear criminal proceedings in a timely fashion, it appears that some of the interest, some of the staffing that we had available to preside over gender violence cases has been diverted to other case types. And we feel, though we don't have the data to support it, entirely, we feel that this is impacting our ability to respond to the victims of violence. So in that inquiry, we convened again a number of courts from across the country, and we began to look at commonalities and some of the issues that various courts were experiencing with regards to data. And it was a very superficial analysis that revealed that significant data elements are not collected in a systematic matter, but they are of significant importance. And I provide a couple of examples here, such as parties present, specifics about postponements, what are the reasons for continuances, and what are some of the elements that would identify the same individual within the court system. This is particularly important because it's not uncommon that, a, that parties will present in one court and then perhaps they have another criminal protection order case or another case that has extreme relevance on the case for, for example, an order of protection. But those cases live disconnected within the case management system, and that prevents the judicial officer from making the best judicial decisions. So in this effort, we began to construct, and I offer it here, it is, it is in draft form but perhaps it offers a helpful overview of some of the data standards that, um, that we have constructed for domestic violence cases. And as you've probably noticed, I often refer to domestic violence. That tends to be the term that we most commonly use when addressing gender violence within, within the United States. And so these standards um, are comprehensive, extremely comprehensive, but what they are intended to do as we did with these participants, um, representatives of various courts that came together in this dialogue. It's intended to represent the various elements that will facilitate data sharing across jurisdictional lines. And it, it is in the, the participants of the lab um, of this backlog effort reported that having these data st standards has been um, helpful in their jurisdictions and sitting down with their with the head of their statistics department and saying, here are the various elements. Are we able to collect these elements? If not, why not? What are the research questions that we would that we would want to answer, but we find ourselves unable to do so? How would we construct a plan to be able to collect that information, to be able to um, answer the questions that we have and ensure that we are applying an equitable process to all and that we're not creating systems where cases are delaying 
without necessarily being aware of it. So um, if we could proceed to the next slide. We stand with you in the pursuit of a gender approach and justice. If any of these materials are of interest, we have various materials about the um, application of technology, certainly would appreciate the opportunity to continue in dialogue. So thank you very much, Dr. Palma. Thank you so much, Ms. Davis, for describing so clearly the functioning of the services, stressing the utmost importance of an institution and a user-centered perspective, considering governance, the user's voice, and the court culture. Now we continue with the following theme. Please, Ms. Evgenia Vondarenko. Thank you, Dr. Palma. Uh, it seems that it is high time to uh, proceed uh, with our third uh, panel. Uh, we have had an opportunity to uh, talk about uh, uh, practices of international uh, judicial institutions uh, and the proper consideration of uh, gender-related uh, issues. Uh, however, I am sure that uh, national uh, professionals uh, uh, can uh, have their say in this uh, discussion too. Unfortunately, I would say uh, because uh, um, as uh, uh, Ms. Christina, uh, Christina Kod, uh, Kid uh, mentioned uh, uh, today, uh, in the recent uh, uh, months, Ukrainian judges uh, have uh, uh, more and uh, more uh, situations uh, where they need to face uh, these uh, gender-related uh, uh, issues uh, due to the great number of uh, war crimes uh, committed uh, in Ukraine uh, in the uh, past uh, years. Uh, our next speaker will be Nadia Stefaniev. Judge, uh, uh, she, she's a very experienced judge, and I think uh, she will uh, have uh, much uh, to share uh, in terms of uh, gender sensitive uh, issues. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear organizers, dear participants. Uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you for displaying my presentation already. As you can see, uh, the topic of my presentation is gender sensitivity in adjudicating uh, war crimes uh, cases. This is unfortunately a very topical uh, issue uh, in Ukraine uh, these days. I tried uh, to uh, combine two components uh, in this presentation, uh, which are gender sensitivity and adjudication in war crimes. Next slide, please. Uh, so war crimes is a new uh, type uh, of uh, cases which emerged in Ukrainian courts. In order to be able to adjudicate in such uh, cases, uh, uh, Ukrainian judges uh, get uh, trained uh, on international humanitarian law, on international uh, criminal law. They uh, look uh, into um, uh, the decisions and uh, uh, judgments of international tribunals, of international uh, ad hoc uh, tribunals uh, which uh, were established uh, at the end of uh, various uh, uh, military conflicts uh, uh, all over the world. I would want uh, to uh, touch upon uh, the issue of vulnerability of victims and uh, uh, witnesses, uh, which is uh, unfortunately uh, always part uh, of uh, uh, war crimes, uh, uh, it comes uh, predominantly to uh, women and uh, children, uh, civilians, uh, because uh, uh, civilians uh, uh, suffer um, more than uh, any uh, other uh, categories uh, when uh, uh, an armed conflict uh, takes uh, place. And uh, as I said, uh, the most vulnerable categories are, of course, uh, women and uh, children. They suffer the most. There are many of such cases uh, pending uh, before Ukrainian law enforcement uh, bodies uh, 
nowadays uh, so the investigations uh, are ongoing and uh, uh, many cases uh, are uh, will be submitted uh, to uh, courts uh, in a short perspective the judicial uh, the judiciary need to uh, be uh, prepared uh, to uh, consider and adjudicate uh, uh, in such cases, but also to uh, properly treat uh, victims and uh, witnesses, uh, proper, properly treat uh, their statements uh, uh, and evidence provided uh, by them, especially if uh, uh, they are uh, collected in other manner uh, than the one prescribed uh, by the uh, current uh, criminal uh, code. Uh, we need to understand uh, that uh, sometimes uh, it is not possible to stick uh, with the letter uh, of uh, law in terms of collection evidence uh, in uh, war crimes. It is in general quite difficult uh, to uh, collect any evidence at all when it comes uh, to war crimes. Uh, uh, victims are and witnesses uh, are reluctant uh, to uh, get in contact uh, with uh, law enforcement authorities. So uh, one need to make an effort in order to detect uh, potential uh, victims and uh, witnesses. Uh, thus, uh, the court will need to assess uh, evidence uh, through a, a very particular and uncommon uh, from an, a very particular and uncommon angle uh, in order to see uh, whether um, the manner in which uh, evidence uh, uh, was received uh, is acceptable and uh, whether such uh, evidence can be properly taken into account uh, when adjudicating a, a case. Uh, this is all about gender sensitivity among other issues. Uh, I recently uh, took part at uh, an event uh, dedicated to uh, children uh, e uh, as uh, victims and uh, witnesses uh, of uh, violent uh, crimes, including uh, war crimes. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, the, the, uh, we, we are talking here not only about uh, uh, teenagers, uh, uh, but uh, also about very young uh, uh, children who have uh, uh, gone uh, through a very uh, traumatizing uh, experience. Uh, and uh, I have to state uh, that uh, in Ukraine, some first uh, steps uh, uh, have been made in order to uh, put uh, these uh, children in um, more comfortable uh, uh, conditions uh, um, to uh, make them uh, witness uh, in a more uh, effect, to, to give them an opportunity to witness in a more uh, effective and uh, safe uh, manner. Uh, so this system of uh, uh, Barna whose uh, uh, centers uh, uh, is being developed across uh, the country uh, so these centers are intended uh, for uh, young children, for uh, you know, teenagers uh, uh, to uh, have the possibility to uh, get interviewed uh, by first responders, but also to take uh, part uh, in uh, court hearings uh, uh, from uh, some safe uh, space. Now, speaking of uh, armed uh, uh, conflict uh, and uh, uh, women uh, in the context uh, of uh, um, U Russia, uh, Russian Ukrainian war. Uh, so, uh, violence, uh, uh, including sexual violence, uh, uh, has been recognized uh, as a weapon of uh, warcraft uh, uh, applied uh, by the Russian Federation. So, uh, uh, all cases of sexual violence, uh, rape, uh, rapes uh, that uh, um, are committed uh, by Russian soldiers, they're not just general uh, 
primes there, uh, but uh, this is uh, the method of uh, Warcraft. So it has been um, acknowledged uh, as uh, uh, such, uh, and uh, it means uh, that uh, uh, such crimes uh, can not be uh, tried uh, uh, under the uh, criminal uh, code uh, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, such uh, crimes, uh, in my opinion, uh, need to be uh, qualified uh, as the international uh, crimes and uh, violations uh, uh, committed uh, by the perpetrators uh, need to be interpreted as the uh, violation of uh, international uh, provisions. Uh, so the uh, crimes, uh, uh, war crimes, uh, sexual crimes, uh, which are being committed in Ukraine uh, <clears throat> constitute uh, uh, challenges uh, for a uh, Ukrainian judiciary. In terms of identifying the perpetrators uh, in the first place, that's at the stage uh, of uh, pretrial uh, investigation. This is why the judges need uh, to be uh, informed about uh, such peculiarities in the framework uh, of uh, the training. They need to be uh, prepared for the fact that uh, in the majority of cases, uh, the um, perpetrators uh, go non-identified. Besides, uh, judges, uh, Ukrainian judges uh, need to be trained uh, to use uh, international documents, uh, uh, including those uh, containing elements of crimes. The next slide is dedicated to uh, the admissibility of uh, evidence. So the court may uh, use uh, as uh, uh, evidence the uh, data from uh, open sources, uh, from uh, in e-sources. E uh, however, uh, the court will need to uh, assess the reliability of, of such uh, evidence. And if you look uh, e at uh, the practice of international institutions, including uh, ECTHR, uh, we will see that uh, the uh, admissibility, uh, even though the admissibility of evidence uh, is usually governed uh, by uh, national uh, provisions, uh, the ECTHR, for example, uh, assesses uh, if uh, the uh, proceedings uh, was, uh, j were just uh, uh, in, in, in general, uh, and uh, on whether uh, the uh, proceedings uh, in a case uh, uh, had not uh, uh, violated uh, the principle of uh, uh, justice uh, in, 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 in the general terms. Um, uh, we were listening to uh, Hackett, Martin Hackett, uh, who said that uh, the uh, uh, judge uh, need to uh, assess uh, evidence, uh, the, the whole uh, uh, evidence in their whole uh, scope. Um, uh, it is indeed a very complicated uh, and a painful uh, situation uh, if uh, a judge can uh, be, you can see uh, clearly that uh, violation had taken place, uh, that uh, a, a victim uh, had uh, indeed uh, suffered uh, and went through a very uh, traumatizing experience, uh, but uh, the evidence uh, had been collected uh, in a manner which uh, does not allow um, for uh, admitting them. And uh, the uh, court uh, 
cannot uh, come up with a, the, the guilty verdict. It is indeed very difficult. It is very painful, and uh, it is it is something which is uh, quite difficult uh, to explain uh, to uh, the uh, claimants. In order to avoid uh, such uh, situations, uh, the evidence uh, in uh, war crime cases, uh, especially when it comes to sexual violence, need to be uh, collected in a very uh, prudent uh, manner uh, with proper observance uh, of uh, uh, international um, standards uh, uh, so that uh, uh, evidence uh, um, uh, are uh, admissible, uh, or at least uh, uh, the chance, uh, uh, the chances uh, for uh, admissibility uh, were quite high. Besides, uh, I cannot but uh, mention uh, that uh, the uh, applying uh, the Berkeley Protocol uh, is uh, uh, highly advisable. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, not a mandatory uh, document. Uh, uh, the uh, protocol uh, was presented uh, by a very uh, renowned institution, which is the University of Berkeley back in 2020. Uh, this is a live document which has uh, been uh, constantly um, updated. Uh, however, as I said, it is uh, uh, not uh, Mandatory, uh, but in my opinion, it, uh, sh its provision should be uh, uh, taken into account. Uh, let me remind here that the Berkeley Protocol provides uh, for the possibility of uh, use uh, of uh, EVE evidence, uh, uh, which are available in um, open sources. Uh, the ECTHR has uh, not uh, come up. Uh, yet uh, with an opinion on the admissibility of such uh, evidence. However, we cannot but uh, acknowledge that uh, uh, it happens uh, quite often that uh, the uh, clear evidence of uh, violence committed in respect of uh, various vulnerable uh, categories become uh, available um, uh, online. And uh, I do hope uh, that uh, uh, at some point in time, very soon, uh, it will become possible to uh, collect uh, uh, evidence uh, based on the Berkeley Protocol and uh, to acknowledge uh, them as admissible. I already mentioned about the interviewing by CSOs, uh, the testimony that needs to be given only once. And the next slide that I'd like to finalize with about terminology. Unfortunately, we don't have enough gender sensitive uh, terminology in uh, judgments and in state uh, documents. Uh, therefore, I guess. First and foremost, uh, we must not have uh, gender blindness. We must be impartial and we must be gender sensitive. Just uh, the last slide here. Why I wanted to present uh, this last slide. Here there is some sort of uh, the gender sensitivity, gender sensitive cases, and gender sensitive court, uh, both in terms of cases and institution. And the same should be the court decision. Thank you for your attention. I can see some questions in the chat. Thank you, dear Nadia, so far. There are no questions directly to you. Thank you so much for touching upon these important issues. And uh, it's, of course, difficult to be very brief when it comes to war crimes, especially topics uh, related to uh, women, children, and the whole Ukraine uh, is now sensitive. I'd like to give uh, the floor to key international expert of the European Justice Project, uh, the 
judge of international court of uh, emission in Kosovo, Anna Damska Galant, uh, who has uh, wide uh, legal uh, experience and uh, judicial experience, especially in these cases. Dear Anna, the floor is yours. And dear speakers, please uh, admit uh, the time line for everyone to be able to present their Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'll be speaking briefly because there are a lot of important things. A lot of important things have been mentioned. I'm trying not to say what has already been told. I want to, co to cover a couple of words about women judges because in war crime cases, the experience shows that women played an important role. They changed uh, the approach to the crimes related to gender violence, uh, they helped to define uh, such crimes as tool of armed aggression, and uh, also they were recognized as war crimes. Uh, that's a very important change, and it shows that gender balance uh, also is important uh, in courts. As it has been mentioned by Justice Stefani and by other speakers, gender violence or sexual violence uh, unfortunately is always a part of the armed conflict women girls are always most vulnerable there is a danger of it that they can become a victim of uh, sexual violence we must remember that women remain alone uh, there are no men who went to fight the war they are very much uh, at huge risk of sexual violence and the threat of sexual violence not, it comes not only from combatants but from other people who use uh, large circumstances of the war in order to in order to commit this sexual violence. Women are at the core of these events and uh, of uh, the focus of international criminal law. They are the most uh, common uh, victims of uh, displacement, uh, and uh, they are uh, the most often victims of uh, sexual violence cases. As we see, it's first international court as far as uh, Nuremberg uh, tri Tribunal and Tokyo Tribunal. Uh, the issue of gender violence or gender crimes uh, or rela related to armed conflict um, didn't matter. Such cases weren't heard there. No victims of sexual violence were heard and um, considered. Also, that's um, it's important that these courts didn't have uh, women judges and this approach was changed uh, only with the in the be beginning of uh, 1990s when uh, there were the wars in former Yugoslavia and uh, this uh, civil war that, that happened in Rwanda. Own resolution uh, that were the basis for creating international tribunals for former Yugoslavia or for Format tribunal for Rwanda provided for the fact that gender violence uh, has to be the subject matter of investigation, has to be the subject matter of uh, court hearings. Um, what is also very important, the Rome Statute provides uh, that there should be uh, the fair representation of men and women amongst the judges to guarantee this gender balance. The way we put it, uh, or when we think of women judges, we understand or we see that they're more sensitive and they better understand uh, the degradation that uh, the uh, victims of war crimes will have to face. It's not just two words that women are more sensitive when we speak of sexual violence uh, here on the slide in the slide you can see a number of uh, the most uh, renowned judges of national courts and tribunals uh, that were very important uh, in changing the approach to uh, sexual violence yeah. 
uh, how uh, sexual violence is uh, viewed in this uh, courts. Patricia Wald, uh, the judge of um, former Yugoslavia, showed uh, that uh, women have unique experience how to change the situation for the better. And uh, Judge uh, Navaneta Mtilai, the only women judge who sat on the tribunal for Vonda, uh, appointed in Jean Paul Akayesu case, uh, and she managed uh, the collection of the testimonies uh, in gen gender violence. It should be emphasized that the Kayesu case was the first case on genocide that actually recognized that sexual violence can be part of genocide. Also, Elizabeth Odio Benito made prosecutors change to the indictment in Dragon College and add uh, the Charges related to gender violence. Judges Teresa Dugetti and Julia Sabutinde, who worked in the special court for Sierra Leone, and Patricia Sellers, she was a prosecutor who worked in Rwanda cases and former Yugoslavia cases, and she uh, drafted this uh, or developed legal argumentation that led to the adoption by the tribunal of Milestone judgments uh, that recognized uh, the act the sexual violence crimes as part of genocide uh, as part of uh, other types of international crimes it shows that uh, women judges can take decisions irrespective of any uh, any bias uh, or assumptions about the nature of women and uh, her sexuality and they have to be very sensitive to victims uh, who have to testify about the most traumatic events in their life and they ensure protection of uh, victims uh, from the violent treatment during the case and uh, investigation and women judges uh, show an example to males and uh, investigators uh, how to work with sexual violence victims. To finalize, I want to emphasize uh, some standards that were adopted in these two tribunals, International Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, where cases related to sexual violence and gender violence were very important. It was uh, unnecessary to emphasize that victim-oriented approach that we spoke about, uh, that we already introducing in uh, Ukrainian courts. It's very important to protect uh, the victims from violent uh, uh, or cruel treatment during uh, the examinations and the hearings. In these two tribunals, they also adopted uh, certain rules related to the collection of evidence. For example, uh, the testimony of uh, sexual violence, uh, a victim do not uh, need to be corroborated. It's very important uh, because in some societies, for example, it was necessary to have three or four uh, witnesses. It's also the prohibition of uh, using uh, the presumption of uh, consent uh, to a sexual act uh, and uh, also any previous sexual behavior of the victim, considerations are not accepted. It has to do with how we hear the victims of uh, sexual violence cases. International Court adopted a number of practical decisions that help uh, uh, protect uh, uh, vulnerable uh, witnesses uh, and uh, victims, how to protect them, how and to make sure that they are not re-traumatized. That's all on my part. Thank you so much for a chance to be here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anna, for your address. Thank you for drawing attention to such important issue as uh, the standing of a women judge, because we see it always from the standpoint of victims and witnesses, but to consider such cases and to be impartial 
that is a real challenge. Now to moderate this panel, I'd like to again give the floor to Dr. Palma for him to present the following speakers. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ms. Voldarenko. Please, Mr. Stanislav Petrenko, Prosecutor of War Crimes, Department of the Office of the Prosecutor General. The floor is yours. Hello, thank you so much. I uh, thank you, Said, uh, for having a chance to attend this conference. <clears throat> and I'll speak on the issues of uh, the war crimes issues. I represent the Office of the Prosecutor General, and our uh, unit has to do with uh, preventing crimes uh, that are committed during the international armed conflict by the representatives of the aggressor state and the units controlled by it. For all of us, it's clear that international armed conflict has posed a huge task and challenges before the law enforcement agencies of Ukraine. And if we don't ensure our self-development, then our law enforcement system will not be able to function effectively in order to uh, in order to identify, track, uh, record, and bring to responsibility the perpetrators of international crimes, uh, of uh, crimes against humanity, and uh, have some uh, genocidal traits uh, on the territory of Ukraine. What is important here is uh, to take into account uh, the persons who are victims and witnesses in a criminal proceeding. So already communicated on this topic, and again, highlight that unfortunately uh, traditionally in the, the criminal justice system especially uh, for the law enforcement agencies the interest to the person of victim and witness was always limit, most mostly limited to the fact that this person is the source of uh, some testimony in criminal proceedings and there wasn't given enough attention to what the person had to go through what uh, core she had to experience and how the law enforcement agencies can help this question was not posed very often and uh, while we tried to counter war crimes we started uh, actually making sure that we properly address this issue do you support for victims and witnesses and what is one of the strategic goals uh, that is deter that is uh, present uh, in uh, how to counteract war crimes in the territory of Ukraine, and it has a specific uh, list of actions that uh, the law enforcement agencies need to take in order to ensure a better investigation. And within this uh, measures, one of our tasks uh, is uh, to look for uh, victims and victim witnesses proactively, trying to identify ourselves persons who may have suffered because uh, of uh, the international armed conflict in order to get information and to provide uh, help to them. Also, it's important how to make sure that the persons are not re-traumatized because unfortunately it often happens uh, that the same person is investigated for many times and uh, is involved in too many investigative actions uh, that actually re-traumatizes a person and uh, leads uh, to uh, the fact that the person needs to experience the same traumatizing event again and again over and over we understand that this must be minimized we must take uh, measures to make sure that the person has uh, the most uh, user-friendly interaction uh, with the law enforcement agencies and so that he or she can recover from the horrible moral damage and other damage he or she suffered. Therefore, the Office of the Prosecutor General is uh, actually, has actually so created uh, the Coordinated Center for victims and witnesses, a new structure that didn't exist before in the structure of the Office of the Prosecutor General. And this center is uh, about providing psychological uh, and professional help to persons who suffered or who witnessed international crimes. And here we are trying to, uh, to implement uh, the 
best practices of international organizations and we understand here that a person or a victim has to be protected and uh, justice needs not only to pursue uh, the perpetrator to responsibility and accountability but also to protect as much as possible the person who has suffered because of the crime and uh, such are the steps uh, by the office prosecutor general which are important and in my deep conviction that they are relevant for the challenges that we have right now. Also, during our conference today, we heard a couple of times the issue of countering the sexual violence crimes during the armed conflict. It also is uh, highlighted as uh, the priority one within our War Department. In the Office of the Prosecutor General, we have specialized department that uh, conducts a procedural overseeing over the sexual violence for crimes. Here we need to pay attention to the fact that, unfortunately, sexual violence covers not only uh, rapes of women or such uh, damage, but also sexualized uh, crimes uh, in um, such uh, when the persons are held captive uh, unfortunately it happens again and again against men and it shows that international crimes are one of the most horrendous uh, manifestations of the unlawful behavior that influences each and every person irrespective of his or her gender sex age and uh, the task of the national law enforcement authorities and we are here also gaining support from international partners is for ukraine to maximize its efforts uh, for it to be able to counter these types of crimes as mo as efficiently as possible thank you so much for giving me the floor and for having me here today Thank you so much, Mr. Petrenko, for your presentation, making such a crucial elaboration on the relevance of the management of the sensitive matter in war crimes cases, enhancing the importance of user-friendly interactions and related services. Please, Ms. Sonia Prostran, Chief of Party, USAID Judicial System Strengthening Activity, East-West Management Institute, Uzbekistan. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, Luis, um, and uh, thanks to the colleagues uh, from um, USA, the um, Chemonics in Ukraine, for this opportunity to speak at this conference. Um, a lot um, that I actually wanted to say um, this evening has already been said. So therefore, my uh, presentation or um, will be uh, basically very brief, and uh, I... Uh, from um, all uh, that has been said, I would basically like to focus or to refer um, to previous um, three speakers, um, to Anna, who has spoken about the importance of the judicial, of the uh, gender parity or gender equality um, in the uh, supply side, so to say, or in um, uh, judiciary or uh, in courts. Um, I would like to um, also refer to um, the uh, to the uh, to what his Ma what Martin was saying about um, victims of uh, violence, uh, sexual violence, and other forms of crime, uh, which are uh, related to, uh, to gender, and also uh, to some extent to what Alicia was uh, uh, saying about certain vulnerable groups. Um, with respect to uh, women judges, and speaking basically from the experience of the country that I currently work and live in, and that is Uzbekistan, I would say that uh, uh, creating Women Judges Association um, is, um, regardless of the number, uh, actual number of women in um, a certain court system, is basically vital uh, to preserve or to uh, maintain and also enhance the position of women in judiciary. Um, and I will explain why. Uh, if we look at the statistics of even of the very developed countries, um, we will see um, that um, uh, even in those countries where women um, are uh, more than 50% uh, of judges, um, 
they do not take that many positions as court presidents. They don't uh, take as many positions in uh, uh, courts of higher interest instances of the courts of second instance or in the Supreme Court. Um, so basically, um, the um, advancing in the career, the promotion um, or the career path in general for women in judiciary is, uh, I would say, much more difficult or with uh, more challenges than for men. Um, and uh, um, secondly, women judges associations across the world basically deal with the issues related to vulnerable groups and um, they deal with, you know, sensitizing the entire court system, but also the entire societies to the vulnerable groups, including victims of gender based and sexual violence, but also people with disabilities, etc. Um, in that sense, I would um, say that um, whether it is formalized as an associate and registered as association or whether it is uh, um, an informal group, a club of women judges, um, this kind of um, uh, uh, organization uh, based on the principle of sisterhood is basically very important for maintaining the, uh, the position of women in the judiciary, but thus also in the society. On the demand side, on the side of the court users, um, I would say uh, that um, I mean training of judges um, on how to deal with the uh, uh, vulnerable group groups in the courtroom, training of prosecutors how to deal with them during the investigation, and finally with the police officers who also investigate in you uh, uh, know who also investigate these crimes is perfectly okay. Um, it's really probably the best thing that we have uh, right now at hand, uh, most of us coming from various uh, parts of the world. But um, um, pardon my French, if I may say, that cannot really be very sustainable because these trainings should be re repetitive given the turnover of uh, personnel in uh, in all these professions. It means that you know trainings have to be supplied over and over again. And also given the limited budgets of the national um, institutions, um, given, given that um, very often these trainings base on the donors' assistance, I would say they really lack sustainability. So what is it that um, we can do to surpass um, this challenge? Uh, what we've done in Uzbekistan, we basically put together in the same room the representatives of vulnerable group and women judges, but outside of the courtroom. This was just the same room and, you know, made them speak, actually uh, made them talk to one another. Um, let the uh, representatives of vulnerable groups speak about um, what they have been through. Um, let the CSOs who have been working with the victims of various crimes, but predominantly gender based violence, speak to judges um, what types of cases they have been dealing with. Most of them, mind you, never reach the court. Um, it is um, um, some you know, general statistics that only about 10% of all gender-based uh, uh, crimes ever reach the court. A bit uh, a larger percentage reaches the prosecution. But most of these uh, victims actually turn to um, informal um, um, informal uh, 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 solutions. Uh, they prefer to talk to um, um, more open or uh, 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 structures such as NGOs um, than to go to the police. Um, and uh, uh, I think that this and this was far more effective than the training. Um, this and role play. We actually made judges be, uh, you know, in the role play. Uh, we actually made judges um, uh, play the role of victims of a crime, and uh, this resulted in some uh, uh, really great results. Uh, to that extent, that there were judges who would really, you know, break down and cry uh, when they actually realized, uh, um, in very artificial circumstances, what a victim of a crime really, of a gender-based or sexual crime goes through. Um, um, one 
there is one also effective example uh, from a neighboring country, but also Central Asian from Kazakhstan. The Kazakhs developed an app um, for police officers and their police officers, they all use um, uh, basically tablets or iPads uh, and carry them with them. So they have installed an app in, the, in, in this device, um, which gives them uh, guidance on how to treat victims and witnesses of different crimes. And quite large section of this app is dedicated to domestic violence. And this app contains questions or and sexual crime, questions that um, shouldn't be asked at any circumstances. Um, also guidelines on how to behave uh, with the uh, victims of these crimes, how to avoid repetitive victimization of victims of these crimes. And it seems that um, um, this app is very useful, um, uh, doesn't really uh, reflect the statistics of the, uh, um, of the overall prevention of gender-based violence, but at least there are more and more cases which uh, get the, and more and more victims that get the court protection um, and more and more police officers that are really aware um, of how to treat uh, how to treat these people. Uh, last but not the least, uh, what we also um, um, uh, kind of achieved is, um, and I would refer to what Alicia was saying about the deaf community. Uh, the deaf community, the uh, this is really I would say everywhere in the world a, a, a forgotten or really marginalized community. And we managed to put together uh, female judges with wi deaf women, uh, representatives of the deaf community, um, who were able to speak not only about the challenges they face when they come to court hearings as uh, uh, witnesses or victims, but also they were able to speak about what they really go through in their families, uh, what are the specificities of uh, um, uh, um, them suffering uh, the domestic violence, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this is um, uh, uh, this is also one of the the, the interesting uh, experiences that I would like to share with you. Um, finally, I think that um, uh, fighting for the gender equality in judiciary or um, um, implementing the gender approach in judiciary in general is. Um, um, actually a fight against stereotypes on all levels and one mustn't forget that um it's you know um for i i, I was a judge for 16 years so i know what i'm talking about from the inside um i know what i'm talking about from uh, the perspective of someone who has worked in the war crimes court and has been in touch with uh the victims of um uh, war crimes, including um, rape and other types of uh, sexual violence, um, as I was also uh, one of the um, one of those who established victims and witnesses support unit in the war crimes court in Belgrade. Um, so I um, I know what. So this is always a fight against stereotypes on all levels, um, and that I think um, I am actually very happy to see um, a large number of men. Uh, in our conference today. This is usually not something uh, that I have been seeing lately. Uh, when there, when there, Whenever there is a gender uh, as a topic, uh, whether it is an international or local conference, um, usually the, the, the most of the participants are women. Um, this doesn't concern us. We know very well um, what we stand before, but um, um, it is basically the stereotypes that we have that we have to fight. Um, lastly, I have just uh, one, um, I would say, a question or dilemma uh, for uh, my Ukraine Ukrainian colleagues with respect to the victims of uh, sexual war crimes. Uh, what we have faced, or actually what happened in Bosnia, um, was that um, there was a lot of work with the women uh, victims of sexual crime during trials but i have seen none or to a very limited extent by some individual enthusiasts i would say um 
sometime afterwards. Because what happened is that uh, the perpetrators uh, served their sentences in prison and they went out. And the victims were basically forced to meet these people in the street. And no one was there to offer them any psychological support. So this is like for the for the health of the community, for the health of nation, um, this is something that um, um, the governments basically have to think through uh, and provide support to uh, to these victims beyond the trial. Thank you very much. Jacoyo. Thank you so much, Ms. Prostrom, for sharing your great national and international experience and for providing us such a comprehensive view. This highlighting the leading role of women judges associations as it relates to vulnerable groups in the courtroom, bringing into consideration the Kazakhstan impressive experience and stressing the necessity of role play and repetitive training to contribute to change the culture in the best desirable manner. We have no questions in the chat box and no hands raised. So uh, we want to thank you so much for your excellent and deeply engaging presentations with picture remarkable developments and achievements in the gender approach to the justice system, gender sensitive case handling and dispute resolution, state of the art on the field through the best international practices and war crimes adjudication, all to make possible the continuous improvements of the justice services for the people. I don't know, seems to be a technical problem. Okay, it's okay. Thank you all for being such a committed audience. Soon we'll post the conference recordings on the IACA website, on the IACA YouTube channel, at IACA slash word. Please stay tuned. Looking forward to meeting with you soon again. We wish you a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays and Christmas and a wonderful new year. Thank you all so much. Have a great day.